Welcome back to Bay's Bible. We are in the season of Epiphany. If you have not seen the previous episodes thus so far for the season of Epiphany, I highly encourage you to do so. Please visit our channel's page to check out all our previous episodes and be sure to hit the subscribe button down below. Our overall short lesson for the season of Epiphany has been, Epiphany is about witnessing and becoming witnesses to Christ's divine glory. So far, we have seen Christ's divine glory shine in his humanity with the Magi, in the divine life of the Trinity at his baptism, and in our own individual humanity with Samuel and Nathaniel last week. Now, you, re you may remember during our first episode for the season of Epiphany that we quoted St. Paul's a letter to the Ephesians, in which St. Paul wrote that the wisdom of God in its rich variety will be made known to all the world. Well, over the next three weeks, we are going to look at the rich variety of the glory of God, especially in how the glory of God acts in the world and how we choose to respond to the works of God. And especially we are going to see this in the next three weeks over how people respond to Jesus in the gospel of Mark. Now, the word glory for us can often evoke very rosy images. Apple cider beer, on the beach, with fireworks, and Instagram filters. But unfortunately, most of our lives are not that pretty. Most of the time, we are either in calamity or we are on the verge of it. But thankfully, the glory of God does not just show up when everything is beautiful and gorgeous. The glory of God also shows up in the midst of these great calamities of our lives. Allow me to get a little personal here with you all for a moment. When I was 19 years old, I experienced an early adult onset of obsessive compulsive disorder. It was uh, traumatic to say the least. I lost sleep, I uh, didn't eat that well, and I eventually was hospitalized. But thankfully, because we had good access to mental health resources, uh, it was during the summer so I could afford to take time off, and my young drug virgin brain responded very well to medications. So I was rescued from that great calamity. But in response to that rescue, I now had to live my life in different ways. I needed to adopt new habits. I needed to respond to that rescue with trying to hold on to it by a change of habits. Now, while I could really use some stupid meme right now to break the heaviness, nope, it's not coming. I wanted to frame this, I wanted to give you this story to frame our passages this week because our passages this week show us how the glory of God acts in the world to save us from great calamity and then how we choose to respond to that salvation with repentance. Like when people say, we need to talk, the story of Jonah can say so much in just a few words. In the first call of God to Jonah to go preach to the city of Nineveh earlier in the story of Jonah, God's call specifically says, go and cry out against it. The Hebrew construction here is kara ale. Kara ale, which is a construction in the Hebrew that often connotes uh, condemnation and judgment. But in this second call of God to Jonah, in our passage of the narrative, God says, go and proclaim to it. The Hebrew here being kara ele, which in the Hebrew Bible is often a construction used for messages of salvation and deliverance. So already in these little subtleties of the Hebrew of the book of Jonah, we see that God's intentions toward the city of Nineveh have changed. But despite this change of God's intentions, Jonah goes to the city of Nineveh and proclaims against it certain judgment. 
basically invoking the God, the, the call of God against Sodom and Gomorrah in the book of Genesis. See, in our Sunday school version of the story of Jonah, we are told that Jonah says, unless you repent, you will be condemned. But the problem is, is that's not what Jonah says. Jonah proclaims a certain message of death. In 40 days, you will be destroyed. So when the Ninevites repent, they are actually doing so on a hunch. You can see this, especially in verse 9, when they say, who knows? There, Jonah hasn't given them any reason to believe that God would change his mind or that any repentance would do. But they'd say, well, if we've got nothing to lose anyway, let's, let's, let's see. Let's bet upon the mercies of God. And you know what? The Ninevites are right. The Ninevites were right to make it such a bet upon God's mercy, for which uh, Jonah's going to have a lot of problems with God later on in the story as we see. But what we need to notice here is actually how a message that was as dire as Jonah's was the means by which Nineveh chose to repent. In our day, environmentalists like the famous Greta Thunberg will often say something like, the world is going to end in 12 years. Unless we stick to the Paris Climate Accord, unless we change our ecological footprint, the world is going to end. We are on the verge of climate calamity. Now, we could be skeptics and we could say, well, you know, there were other times when environmentalists pre predicted great disaster and it didn't come about, like uh, food shortage or overpopulation. But that would actually miss the point about what these apocalyptic messages do. How many people do you know that uh, would have changed their diets, that would have adopted electric cars, that would have recycled more, had they not believed that there was real climate crisis? So these apocalyptic messages about the world ending in 12 years, regardless of their merits, affect change in a positive direction. Because however we, much we don't like to talk about it, the fact is that fear can often be a great spur to repentance. That fear can actually affect change to a more positive direction, even if that fear is unfounded. St. John Chrysostom, the 4th century preacher that we've referenced in previous episodes. In fact, uh, we've done a review of, of a book about him that I encourage you to go check out on our channel. He makes reference to the story of Jonah in one of his homilies, and this is what Chrysostom says. For the fear was the cause of their safety. The threatening affected the deliverance from peril. The sentence of destruction put a stop to the destruction. Oh, strange and astonishing event. The threatening of death brought forth life. See, perhaps Nineveh was too complacent, too apathetic in their violence and their sin to have had their lives changed by anything less than a completely dire message about where they were going to go. So in this case, God's glory, acting as the savior of Nineveh, is actually done by means of a message of terror and judgment. And God is giving such a message of terror and judgment, not primarily to make the people feel doom and gloom, but precisely to spur us out of our apathy and lethargy to embrace repentance and hard won change to actually move towards salvation in response then to the glory of god acting as our savior by means of a message of judgment we should respond not by trying to negotiate or ask for gentleness but with the hard won repentance that the ninevites displayed Sometimes in our lives, we see something that makes absolutely no sense to us and we need someone to explain it to us. 
For instance, I was completely flabbergasted when I saw that Kanye West, whose father was a Black Panther, come out in support of Donald Trump. Whereas Eminem, who was literally from a white working class Midwestern background, came out against Trump. That made no sense to me as to why these two men should have taken the positions with regards to Trump that they did. I needed someone to explain it to me. Well, so likewise in our story from Jonah, it's not immediately clear as to why the Ninevites would have trusted the message of a Jewish prophet and put their trust in the God of Israel for their salvation. So our psalmist, in some sense, is here to give us a rationale as to why we should trust the God of Israel and hope in him for our salvation like the Ninevites did, especially in verses 9 to 12. In verse 9, we return to a theme that came up often during the season of Advent, which is the impermanence of humanity, that the people are like grass, that they are like a breath. And why do we need to be reminded of this? Well, we need to be reminded of this because sometimes our society and our lives can have the illusion of stability. Our uh, grocery stores, our food chains, our uh, healthcare systems, our politics, anything else can appear to be so secure and stable that we implicitly believe that they will last eternally, that they will always be there, and that we can trust and rely in them. And truthfully, it's just a matter of grace and good fortune that we here in North America have been able to take a holiday from the chaos of history that we have. But if 9-11 and the 2008 economic recession and the COVID-19 pandemic have taught us anything, it's that our societies are not as stable as they appear, and that ultimately they are fragile. And this is why in verse 10 in particular, our psalmist warns very much against us seeking economic and material prosperity. Because as material creatures, it's actually very easy for us to seek out material and economic security. I know for myself that whether I have a lot of money in the bank account or very little, and in this case it's very little, so please consider becoming a Patreon subscriber, that whether I have a lot or a little, I need the money to come in constantly. Otherwise, I begin to feel the anxiety of scarcity that I am not going to have enough. But our psalmist warns us against robbing future generations of their social safety net, of trying to extort people of, through taxes or through other things to pay unpayable debts, or to subsidize uh, through credit economies that we place our faith in to have ultimately a V-shaped economic swing when we don't know that that's actually going to be the case. Because if we continue to supply these systems that are fragile with the illusion of security, we are deluding ourselves. And this is why in verses 11 to 12, our psalmist gives us the reasons why we should trust the God of Israel instead of our governments or our economic systems or anything else that has the illusion of eternal stability. Our psalmist says that power and steadfast love ultimately belong to God. So our psalmist is claiming that once you trace where all power, security, salvation, stability ultimately lie, that they ultimately lie in God, and that, that, and that he is the one that we should put our ultimate faith and trust with all of our hearts in, and not in the illusions of stability that our society provides for us. St. Paul, throughout chapter 7 of his first letter to the Corinthians, is addressing another one of his community's uh, philosophical viewpoints, in the midst of which he gives his counsel about marriage and signal singleness. And toward the end of this chapter, just before our passage, St. Paul basically says, don't worry about your station in life. Stay where you are. Now, as a 29-year-old single man, with uh, tens of thousands of dollars of student debt, is on his third university degree, 
living at home with uh, sick parents under COVID-19 restrictions, when I hear St. Paul say, sit tight, just stay where you are, I want to punch him in the face. But in our passage, we actually get Paul's rationale as to why he is giving this caution. He says, for the present form of this world is passing away. Now, in order to understand just a little bit better why St. Paul says what he says, we can turn to another ancient Christian text that is outside of the Bible, known as Sixth Ezra. Sixth Ezra is written toward uh, the end of the third century CE in the eastern part of the Roman Empire uh, during a time when Christians are experiencing a famine. And the author of 6 Ezra has taken the sign of the famine as uh, the end of days is upon us. Yes, Christians have always been taking great, terrible events as signs that the end of the world is coming. Some things just don't change. But why 6 Ezra is so important for us is because 6 Ezra clearly read St. Paul. And he clearly read the passage that we have read here. And 6 Ezra kind of takes over that passage and interprets it and expands upon its meaning a bit, I think in a very faithful way. Here's what our author 6 Ezra writes that expands upon what St. Paul said. Hear my words, O my people. Prepare for battle. And in the midst of the calamities, be like strangers on the earth. Let him that sells be like one who will flee. Let him that buys be like the one who will lose. Let him that does business be like who will not make a profit. And let him that builds a house be like one who will not live in it. Let him that sows be like one who will not reap. So also him that prunes the vines like one who will not gather the grapes. Them that marry like those who will have no children. And them that do not marry like those who are widowed. Because those who labor, labor in vain. For strangers shall gather their fruits and plunder their goods and overthrow their houses and take their children captive. For in captivity and famine they will beget their children. Those who conduct business do it only to be plundered. 6 Ezra then is helping us clarify what exactly St. Paul is trying to say. And it seems clear that what St. Paul is trying to say in his letter to the Corinthians is, guys, a great calamity is coming, whether it's a war or a famine that the Christian community might experience. Thus, don't, uh, don't think too much about marriage. Um, don't, you know, buy a house because the way that the world is presently arranged is going to collapse. It's going to come to an end. Like a... Uh, an investor or a uh, stock advisor that says, you know, don't invest in the stock market right now because it's about to take a huge nosedive and you will lose everything. So too, St. Paul is saying, listen, the present form of this world is about to pass away. A lot of stuff that you took for granted is gonna pass away. So don't invest too much of your heart and your possessions and everything in it because, and don't seek to have a different arrangement in life because the way that this world is structured is going to pass away. So then, for this epiphany, as we see the glory of God acting as our Savior, St. Paul in our epistle is admonishing us to become detached from the world because the way that the world is currently arranged, God is going to bring an end in judgment. Now you have to love the unironic way Mark tells us what the cost of following Jesus is. We begin our passage with, and after John the Baptist was arrested, yes, John the Baptist, remember our friend John the Baptist? Well now, Herod has thrown him in prison because John the Baptist denounced Herod's marital arrangement. In fact, our first century Jewish historian, uh, Josephus, tells us that Herod was afraid of John the Baptist because John the Baptist was so popular that uh, he probably could have led an insurrection against Herod if he really wanted to. 
So, the Gospel of Mark, even before we get to what Jesus' message is, tells us immediately what the cost of being associated with Jesus might be, getting arrested by the king. Now, when we come to Christ's message, he repeats for us some of the themes that we found in the story of Jonah and in our psalm. The importance of repentance and then trust and belief and faith in God. But, as New Testament scholar Ben Witherington III writes concerning the scene that happens next in our passage, he writes, The four men weren't called upon to repent and believe but rather to leave their nets and follow. So Christ calls his first apostles to abandon their families and their businesses. Now people don't just abandon their families and businesses because some random dude told them so. Despite what we might see in some of the movies, Jesus was not a uh, first century Jewish Barack Obama that was just so charismatic that people just fawned over him and even without knowing who he was, was just like, yes, I'll go and follow you wherever you go. No, no that, that's not how it went down. See, John the Baptist, we know, was super, super popular. And John the Baptist was telling everyone else, go look at Jesus. So we know then that the world at this point, or at least the, that society there, they know who Jesus is. So there's a good chance that these guys that are being called here do at least know who Jesus is and what he is calling them for. Now, while it is true that in some later rabbinic literature, fish are compared with uh, disciples or students, what Jesus does here is not call students like a rabbi. For in later rabbinic literature, we see that rabbis actually wait for their disciples to come to them. But what Jesus is doing here is going out to find these people and to bring them in himself. This is very, very different than the relationship between rabbis and students. No, something else is going on here. One of my former professors and a biblical scholar in his own right, Brian J. Walsh, in his uh, commentary on the, the book of Habakkuk, produced also by the Wine Before Breakfast community, Walsh writes concerning this scene that we assume Jesus is talking about evangelism, but show me one fish who ever thought that being pulled out of the water, whether by hook or net, was good news. Indeed, the image of catching people like fish whether by hook or net, is used consistently throughout the Hebrew Bible as an image for God's judgment upon the rich and powerful. Chad Myers, in his commentary on the Gospel of Mark, Binding the Strong Man, writes this about our scene. Taking this mandate for his own, Jesus is inviting common folks to join him in his struggle to overturn the existing order of power and privilege. For our gospel passage then, in this, for, for Epiphany this week, we see that we are to respond to God's glory, like John the Baptist did and like Jonah did, to actually go and call out people in positions of power, to preach other people to other people that their need to repent, to call out sin, to proclaim God's judgment upon the world. Our overall lesson for the, for the season of Epiphany has been, Epiphany is about witnessing and becoming witnesses to Christ's divine glory. And this week we saw God's glory in how he acts as our savior from judgment and then what we should do in response to God to, to God being our savior in the following four ways. Not negotiating or asking for gentleness, but with a hard won repentance. Putting our trust in God with all our hearts for our salvation. By becoming detached from the world as it is presently, which God is about to bring to an end by taking an active role as those who will challenge the world, holding it to account for its sins, proclaiming God's judgment upon the ways of the world. Friends, thank you so much again. Please 
Remember to uh, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram. Uh, please consider also becoming a Patreon member. Uh, that would be really, really wonderful. We really, really appreciate it in order to keep this work going. You can find all this info down below in the description of each video. Thank you for coming week after week. We look forward to seeing you here again next week as we go through another aspect of the glory of God acting in the world during the season of Epiphany. Blessings to you.